and sit this off. I'm going to just start. Okay, so now we're live, and uh, I'm going to go to Facebook and mute myself out. So, Svetoslav, over to you. Mm -hmm. So, we are starting, right? Let's, we're let's starting. wait for a few seconds, because we have only 13 participants jo joining us as, at the moment. Let's take 20, 20 more seconds, and then we'll start. Now, who's taking the lead right now, Ihor? No, myself, set us off. Okay. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We will be starting our online webinar targeted at the small, small and medium business owners as well as a wider array of stakeholders. First of all, I would like to welcome everyone who joined us today. My name is Svetoslav Kavetsky, and I'm an exec executive director of the Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, and I will be a moderator today. I, I would also like to acknowledge Igor Mikhalchushin, UCC National CEO, who will, be, uh, who will be moderating today's event from a technical standpoint. This event is being brought to you by the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress National, Canada-Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, and Ukrainian-Canadian Professional and Business Federation. Now, let's get down to business. I would like to outline the agenda of the COVID-19 Ukrainian-Canadian Business Webinar. This seminar aims to address challenges that Ukrainian-Canadian business community faces at this time and help find solutions. Our speakers are MP for Etobicoke Center, Ivan Baker, uh, Wally Rudensk and Jacob Engimir from MNP, and Uliana Tomiuk, VP at Connor Clark and Loon uh, Financial Private Capital. Sorry. A uh, webinar will be split into three sessions. Each speaker will de deliver his or her presentation. I believe our speakers will have visual slides to share with you as well. After each session, we will have Q&A. And, and you are encouraged to put your questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom app. We created a poll and would like to ask all of our participants to answer the question what province they are from. Now, let's start our webinar. I'm sure most of you know our first speaker, Ivan Baker, Member of Parliament for Federal Riding of Etobicoke Centre. He is a member of the Liberal Party of Canada. Before entering federal politics, Ivan served as the Liberal Member of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario for the Provincial Riding of Etobicoke Centre from 2014 to 2018. Ivan is a devoted community leader and has been a fierce advocate for his riding for many years. He is a management consultant and instructor at the Schulich School of Business at York University and understands what it takes to grow the economy and create good, well-paying jobs for our middle class. Our distinguished guest will address the issue of accessing government support. Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I welcome all of you onto this teleconference. It's really an honor to have been invited and I thank Svetoslav and and Ihor at UCC and everyone for inviting me to participate and all of you for joining. Um, what I'm going to do today is speak a little bit um, as a member of parliament uh, about the programs that government has in place to support businesses through the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what I will do is I will be putting up slides to summarize the points I'm making and, um, and I, at the end of the presentation I will be providing you with my contact information. So if you have follow-up questions that I'm not able to tackle during this webinar, I'd be happy to do that or ask my staff to do some research to do that for you. Um, I'll spend about 10 minutes presenting and then I'll take questions for about 10 minutes pending Svetoslav's uh, decisions around how we want to manage the time and the agenda. So what I will do first is I'm going to uh, share with you my presentation. And there we are. And hopefully you can all see this. So what what I'd like to do is, the objectives for my presentation today are really twofold. One is to review the Government of Canada's emergency support measures for business and the steps uh, taken to protect our economy in, resp in response to COVID-19, and then respond to your questions, as I said. When we think about the Government of Canada's response to what's happening uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, we can think of it, or I think of it, in three categories. One is protecting our health and safety. The second is emergency supports for individuals. And the third is emergency supports for business. And of course, I'm gonna focus on number three, the emergency supports for business. In terms of the first point, protecting the health and safety of Canadians, uh, this is just a quick slide. I'm not gonna go through the details, but it gives you a summary of some of the things, some of the major initiatives that are being taken to protect us from the COVID-19 pandemic. Everything from 
uh, investments in PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, border measures, travel restrictions, consular support, uh, work to develop a vaccine and testing, et cetera. The second point is the emergency support for individuals and businesses, you, uh, individuals, I should say, and families. And you would have seen a lot of this in the news, everything from EI to the Canada Emergency Response Benefit uh, to uh, increasing the Canada Child Benefit, et cetera. This is, this is the sort of the second pillar, if you will, of our response. Um, today's focus is, of course, on the emergency supports for business, and that's what the rest of the presentation will be focused on. This slide here is a summary of the major supports for business that the Government of Canada has put in place. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about these by category and then dive deeper into a few of them that I think are particularly relevant to the people on this call, to the business people in our community, and then I'm happy to take questions as well. As you can see, the emergency support measures for business break down into a number of categories. The first category is support for those who are self-employed or for individuals, individual business people, sole proprietors or, or, um, or owners of businesses where, that are, where, they, where they are self-employed. Um, and the major, the, ma the program to support them there is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there's a second category of programs designed to help companies avoid layoffs or to rehire employees that they've had to furlough or, or lay off or reduce hours for. Um, the third category is access to credit. A lot of companies have, uh, as a former business person and management consultant myself, I understand this, but the feedback I get from business people in Etobicoke Center is that they need access to credit so that they can uh, meet their obligations for the duration of the crisis and then so that they're able to continue operating their businesses when revenues bounce back, when they can bring their staff back on, et cetera, after the crisis is over. The fourth category is deferred payments. So the government's defer, uh, given uh, businesses more time to pay their income taxes. Those payments are deferred until August 31st, and they've, deferled, uh, they've deferred the uh, remittance of sales tax and custom duty until June 30th. The fifth category is support for community organization, charities, and nonprofits. I know that I'm involved, I know a lot of people who are here are business people, but you're also involved in many community organizations in our, in our Ukrainian Canadian community. And, uh, and volunteer and support those organizations. There's, there's, there's programs for, for, for those nonprofits and charities. And then there's broad measures to support our macroeconomic financial stability. The focus of the rest of my presentation is gonna be on the items that are shaded in gray at the moment. So I'm gonna, I've selected a handful, about half of these programs to highlight for you into more detail. The first one is the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. This is one that you've undoubtedly heard a lot about. This mainly applies this doesn't apply to businesses directly, but it applies to individuals, particularly those who are self-employed um, and those who are no longer receiving uh, as much income as they used to from their business or from their employment. So it's available to people residing in Canada who stopped working because of reasons related to COVID-19. Um, they've had employment income of at least $5,000 in 2019 or in the 12 months prior to applying. Um, they can't have quit their job voluntarily. They must have lost their job due to COVID-19. Um, and when submitting your claim, you cannot have earned income or plan to earn income of more than $1,000 uh, for 14 or more consecutive days. So if you're gonna be learning, earning less than $1,000 in that 14 day period, then you qualify for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. And of course, this is designed to get money into people's pockets who've lost their income or substantially lost their income. The, one of the programs designed to help businesses retain and hire back employees is the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. This is a, one of the more significant programs for businesses, and, and you would have heard a lot about this and may have looked into this already. Uh, in essence, what it is, is if your uh, business has been severely impacted by COVID-19, and the way we measure that is uh, business revenue loss of 30%, and I'll get into the details of that in a moment, but a business that's lost 30% of revenue um, can qualify for to have the wages, 75% uh, of the wages of its employees covered up to the first $58,700 in income earned by employees. Now, as you'll see in the second bullet, um, for March, um, the COVID crisis really started in mid-March. And so for March, the government reduced that 30% benchmark to 15% in recognition that many businesses wouldn't have been affected immediately as much in March uh, because the crisis began later, later through the month. So uh, the way you measure your revenue loss 
um, you have the choice as a business of comparing your revenue in each reporting period, so in March, in April, and May, to the same month in 2019. So if year over year in the same month you had a decline of 15% of, of in March or 30% in April or May, you would qualify. Or you can compare your, uh, your, most, your March, April, or May revenue to an average of the revenue earned in January and February of this year. Um, applications will begin on April 27th. It'll be, the program will be in place from March 15th to June 6th. In other words, it'll cover that period, wages over that period. Um, and it's, a co it's available to companies big and small, as well as nonprofit organizations. This table summarizes what the, the revenue reduction calculation, I won't go into a lot of detail, but this is meant to basically indicate that if you're looking at subsidizing a subsidy for wages from March 15th to April 11th, that's the first row of this table, um, then you can have a, a reduction of revenue of 15% will allow you to qualify for, to subsidize wages during that period. For the remaining periods of April and May, uh, then you need to have a 30% reduction in your revenue um, against the baseline that I described earlier. Another program is uh, the Canada Emergency Business Account. This is basically a $40,000 loan program, um, and it's implemented by financial institutions, by banks and, and uh, credit unions. And to qualify, you need to demonstrate that you paid between $20,000 to, to $1.5 million in total payroll in 2019. And uh, if you repay the balance before the end of this calendar, uh, before December 31st of 2022, uh, that can result of loan forgiveness of 25%. So up to $10,000 if you borrow the entire 40,000. This is meant to get people cash quickly and immediately so they can cover their most immediate short-term expenses, including perhaps keep people on payroll until they're able to qualify or receive the wage subsidy that I talked about in a previous slide. The Canada, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance. Uh, we've heard from a lot of business people that they're struggling to pay the rent. And so this is a program that was announced over the past uh, week or so. Um, we're working with the provinces who have jurisdiction over this area. But basically, the idea here would be that we would seek to provide loans, the government would provide loans, including forgivable ones, to commercial property owners if they, in turn, uh, committed and uh, either lowered or for, or or completely um, uh, forwent the rent for small businesses for the months of April, May, and June. So the idea here is to relieve small and medium-sized businesses of the obligation to pay rent, commercial rent where possible, especially where their income, their revenue is negligible or, or has completely been eliminated. The business credit availability program, I won't go into a lot of detail here, there's a number of initiatives here, but in a nutshell what the government's doing is providing over $10 billion of loans through the Business Development Bank and Export Development Bank of Canada. It's targeted to small and medium-sized businesses. Um, and you basically, to access this funding, this, these potential loans, you need to approach your financial institution, your bank or your credit union. Um, and basically the program includes two key um, components. One is a loan guarantee, um, and another one is a co-lending program of about up to six, point, six and a quarter million dollars for small and medium-sized businesses. So again, you would, to, to apply for this, to explore it, to see whether you qualify, you need to approach your bank or credit union. There are a number of, of businesses that wouldn't be able to qualify for these benefits that I just talked about. There are many early stage companies, um, and, and so uh, the government is providing $270 million to two organizations. One is Futurepreneur. This is an organization that helps from, uh, from beginning to end to get a, a small business off the ground. And um, they'll be receiving $20 million, and the Industrial Research Assistance Program will receive the balance, $250 million, to support, um, to support businesses as well, early stage and young, young entrepreneurs. And applications uh, have began a couple of days ago for that. And then there's a number of businesses who won't qualify for many of the above, or maybe even any of the above. And so Canada, the Government of Canada already has in place a number of regional development agencies throughout the country. You see them listed in the, in the bottom uh, bullet there. Um, but we're providing an additional $675 million to give financing support through these organizations to, uh, to businesses as well. So that's a, another option for, for some businesses. This will, this will help. These regional development agencies are designed to diversify our local economies. And so as long as you're fitting those criteria and the others that they would have, then this might be something that you might qualify for. The other thing I mentioned was the, the deferral of income taxes. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide in the interest of time. But again, you, businesses can defer until after August 31st of this year, the payment of any income taxes that are owing on or after March 18th and before September 2020. Um, and they can defer sales tax remittance and custom duty payments until June 30th. Um, and you can see the specifics there on that slide. 
Um, there's also a fund that is designed to support nonprofits and charities, especially those providing essential services. This is not technically for businesses, for for-profit businesses, but I put this slide up because I know many of you in the community are involved with or lead or financially support um, charities in our, in our community. And those that are providing some of, the, some of the services that you see in those bullets um, on this slide uh, could qualify for up to 300, for some of the $350 million that's been put aside. And this is again, to help those charities uh, uh, provide those essential services that we all need right now in the crisis, whether that's supporting seniors or helping vulnerable Canadians or whatever the case may be. Well, at a time when people are not donating as much or so the revenues dried up and at, and at a time when they can't access as many volunteers. So this is meant to support them and obviously deliver the services to Canadians that we need. So as a recap, this is this slide shows you the full, I showed you the slide earlier. This is the full sort of summary of the programs available by the government of Canada for business in, during this COVID-19 crisis. And you can see the gray, uh, grayed out programs, uh, highlighted programs are the ones that I've gone through in greater detail. And, um, and, I, and I would be happy to take uh, any questions. If any of you want, on a regular basis, every few days, I send out an email newsletter updating people on the latest programs for businesses and for individuals. Um, if you're interested in signing up for that or have follow-up questions that we can't take, that I'm not able to tackle on this, on this conference call, please uh, reach out to me there. The best thing to do is go to my email, ivan.baker at parl.gc.ca and, and ask for assistance or ask to sign up to my newsletter and we'll just, we'll just add your email and I'll make sure you're getting this information on a regular basis. And, uh, and with that, I'm happy to take, uh, to take questions. So I'm going to thank you, Ivana. Thank you. Thank you for this really, really interesting, interesting presentation. Um, I don't. Okay, we have a question in Q and A. Uh, it's a thank you note. Thanks for leading this presentation, Ivan, from Oleg. Um, okay. okay, I'll I'll start with my question. Um, what do you think? What are the expectations in terms of a number of uh, applicants who will apply for this uh, wage subsidy program, which will start next in few days? Are there any numbers? And because, as far as I remember, the numbers of people that applied for program uh, for um, program for employees um, in terms of lost income exceeded expectations. What do you think about this one? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to say, uh, I'm not gonna be able to give a, give a precise figure, uh, Svetoslav, in terms of how many businesses we expect to apply for the wage subsidy. Um, I expect quite a large percentage of Canadian businesses to apply. I say that for two reasons. One is, of course, so many businesses are struggling right now. Um, and so a lot of them are reaching out for help. Um, and the other is because of the way the program was designed, I appreciate it, not everybody is eligible, uh, but, uh, the, the program characteristics and criteria were designed in such a way to try to make it as accessible as possible to as many employers as possible. So I suspect a large percentage to, to apply. Um, the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, the one where you can receive up to $2,000 a month, uh, we've had up until today almost 9 million Canadians have applied. So that gives you an indication of, you know, uh, of how many people, what percentage of the population is needing help, and I suspect a similar percentage of the business community needs that help as well. Okay, thank you. Let's look. Okay, we don't have any any other question at the moment. Probably uh, closer to the end of the, our presentations, maybe some other questions will appear. So you will stay with us to the end, right? Of course. And you'll be able to to uh, answer a few other questions. Thank you, Ivana. Yeah. Um, I think this covers our first first stage agenda a item. Now we will continue to our second presentation delivered by representative of MNP Wally Rudensky and Jacob Andimir. Wally is a dedicated to working closely with owner-managed companies and entrepreneurs. His breadth of focus includes corporate reorganization, domestic and international tax, scientific research and experimental development, tax claims and estate planning. By utilizing his skills in finance, tax and administration, Wally has taken on the role uh, of CFO for various private and publicly traded companies. Jacob is a Canadian tax partner working uh, out on MNP's Mississauga office. Jacob specializes in estate and succession planning for owner managed and their families, providing in a, in a innovative solutions tailored to each client's specific needs. Jacob works with clients in wide range of industries, including manufacturing, real estate, automobile, and professionals. His objectives include helping his clients minimize tax and planning for business succession. Jacob takes pride in helping business owners focus on what matters to them. 
their business and their family to ensure that they are well prepared for the future. Guys, we can follow from this. Hi, it's uh, this is Wally calling. Um, I'm going to defer the discussion to J uh, uh, to uh, Jacob because uh, uh, I want to avoid uh, any repetition. And uh, Jacob's a partner of mine in the Mississauga office and uh, is very close to this whole program. Go ahead, Jacob. Great, thanks, Wally, and uh, thank you for uh, having me on and uh, giving me the chance to present. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is uh, really to just focus in on some of those programs that uh, Yvonne has already mentioned and just go into some more of the details on uh, kind of how to apply and what those calculations might look like. Uh, mainly, we're going to discuss the, uh, the wage subsidies as uh, this is, I think, one of the, the bigger programs uh, relating to businesses that has just been recently announced. And I know we're getting a lot of questions from our clients on uh, eligibility on, and how to apply and what things need to be considered. I, I only have 10 minutes or so to go through everything, so it's not going to be in depth and answer all of your questions, but at least I hope to uh, give you some information that you can take back and uh, discuss with your advisors and uh, determine your eligibility for these programs. So the uh, Emergency wage subsidy is, uh, as was mentioned, is the 75% subsidy uh, retroactive to March 15th and up to a maximum of $847 a week for a 12-week period. And the, the legislation introduced uh, is it's very complex and uh, there are some complicated formulas that are in there. Um, mainly, I think, just to make sure that people aren't abusing the program and it's also intended to capture as many businesses as possible. So I want to go through just an example of a calculation just to show how this works in practice. So an example that we've provided here is you have an employee before the crisis, uh, they were earning $2,000 a week. Uh, now because of uh, reasons that decline in the business, uh, you have to give them reduced pay. Uh, you've decided that uh, $750 a week is uh, the amount that you can pay them. Uh, and we'll look at what this looks like through the formula. Uh, you'll see on the screen, uh, it's a very complicated calculation. It's the greater of the least of two different amounts. Uh, really at a high level, what this is doing is it's looking at what did you pay the employee beforehand? That's the $2,000 and what's 75% of that amount? So in this case, it's $1,500. Uh, the maximum you can get per week is 847. So because that's less than the 1500, your cap is now 847. And then you look at what did you actually pay the employee because you can't get reimbursed more than what you are paying the employee. So in, in this case, your maximum subsidy would be the full $750 that you're paying the employee. I think an important thing to note here is that uh, this actually results in a 100% subsidy of the cash that's coming out of the employer's pocket. Uh, the, the government has uh, encouraged employers, if they can and where possible, to uh, keep employees being paid the same as what they were being paid before the crisis. But I think they also, they also understand that that's just not going to be possible for some businesses. So they are allowing uh, employers to, uh, to only pay the subsidy amount, in, in this case, uh, with the formula working out the way it has. Uh, and there's nothing in the legislation that requires you to top up the remainder of the the salary. Uh, one other part of the subsidy uh, is specific to employees that you're paying who are on leave. So this is you've made the business decision that uh, they are not required to work. You may be shut down, but you've decided to still pay them while they're off. Uh, including, so if they're eligible for the wage subsidy and you go through the formula and determine what you're able to claim, you're also eligible to claim the employer portion of the CPP in EI that you would normally pay. So you pay that normally with your remittances to Canada Revenue Agency uh, as you would normally, but then you can include that amount in your calculation of the subsidy. So that's one additional benefit uh, if it makes business sense to have someone on leave uh, with pay. And, uh, this, this chart was uh, shared already, so I won't spend too much time on it. Uh, the, the key uh, here is that uh, each qualifying period is separate. 
and you have to qualify for each four week period separately to claim the subsidy. And uh, the, the timelines uh, don't line up exactly. So you're looking at your revenue decline for March and that covers payroll for the period from March 15th to April 11th. And then your next period for April and the April 12th to May 9th period is a separate calculation. And as mentioned, you can use the prior year months to decide, determine whether you've met the revenue decline of 15 or in March or 30% afterwards, or you can use the average of January and February 2020. Once you've chosen a method, you have to stick with it for the remainder of the, the periods. And one other important thing to note is uh, as soon as you qualify for one period, you automatically qualify for one additional period after that. So for example, if you meet the 15% test in March, regardless of what happens in April, you will qualify for April subsidy as well. You do have to re-qualify for May's period. And just to talk a bit more about what revenue is, it's essentially your operating revenues. Uh, so you're looking at the provision of goods, so, uh, services or sale of goods, uh, or the use of resources of your company uh, in Canada. You can sell to outside of Canada, but the revenue has to be earned in Canada and taxed in Canada. If you're selling to related parties, uh, there are some special elections and exceptions in the rules and uh, highly recommended you reach out to uh, your advisors to go through those rules. If, if you uh, think you may be in in those areas, uh, they can become quite complex to do the calculation and it's not just a straight 30% revenue drop test anymore when you're looking with related parties. So how can you apply for this? Uh, starting on Monday, April 27th, there will be access online to apply. There's three available options. If you have a My Business account portal, there should be the application on there. Uh, there should be a web-based application. Uh, it'll require a web access code, which uh, you can get online. You can request one through Canada Revenue Agency's website. It should be a fairly simple process. Uh, and the, another alternative is if uh, your representative has access, they can apply on your behalf through the represent a client service. Uh, I think you need to discuss that with your advisor and see if that makes sense. So you will be needing to provide financial information on your revenues and your employees and your salaries that you're paying. So it, it might not make sense for your representative to do it if internally you have all the information already. So it's just something to consider. And there is a calculator that has been released. Uh, if the, the link is on the slide. Uh, and if you, if you Google CEWS calculator, it also pops up and there's an Excel download that Canada Revenue Agency has released uh, if you need some help calculating the amount of the subsidy. Uh, highly recommended to, to use that. It's, it makes it a lot easier. So uh, just a few more slides to touch on some of the other programs uh, and then we can take some questions. Uh, this temporary wage subsidy was, uh, was announced before the 75% subsidy and it is, does still apply uh, regardless of whether you qualify for the 75%. Uh, if you do qualify for the 70%, any amounts you claim under this program uh, reduces your claim for the 75%. So you can only get a maximum of the 75%. This subsidy is uh, more restrictive. It's only applicable to Canadian controlled private corporations uh, who are eligible for the small business deduction. There's some other nuances, but essentially if you qualify for the small business deduction, the lower rate of corporate tax, you'll be eligible for this subsidy. Uh, there's no revenue decline test in this. If you have employees and you meet the criteria, uh, you'll be able to claim this subsidy. And this one is done by directly reducing your payroll withholdings instead of applying for it afterwards. It's, there's a maximum of $13.75 per employee, up to a maximum of $25,000 per employer. And it's calculated based on 10% of the wages you're paying. So just to give you a numerical example, if you have five employees that are earning a monthly salary of $4,100, you have total payroll of 20,500. Your subsidy over that period of time is going to be 10% of that 
2050. Over the three month period that the subsidy is in place for, your total is 6,150. That's less than the $25,000 cap. So you are entitled to that entire amount. And 6,150 divided by your five employees is less than your 1375 maximum. So you're not capped on that either. So your, your claim would be the full 6,150. And some of the stimulus credit programs, again, uh, Yvonne mentioned uh, all three of these. I'm just going to touch on a bit more detail on the, the emergency business account. So as mentioned, it's a, an interest-free loan of up to $40,000. Just to, to, to be clear on the criteria of, as to who can apply and how to apply for this, uh, this is meant for operating businesses uh, that, and the loan must be used to cover non-deferrable operating costs such as payroll, rent, utilities, insurance, property tax, regular debt payments. Uh, you do need to have between $20,000 and 1.5 million of payroll on your 2019 T4 summary. Uh, that's the criteria to qualify. And there is the forgivable amount of up to 25% 25% of the loan amount. So of the 40,000 up to 10,000 could be forgiven if repaid before the end of 2022. And this application is done uh, directly through your bank. Uh, so it's not through Canada Revenue Agency. Every bank has their own application process. Okay, that's the end of the, the slide portion. I, we can uh, take some questions. Uh, Thank you, Jacob, for a detailed presentation. I see there are a few questions. You might want to address them. And sure, I'm just going I think we'll now. do them live. So you just turn on to live and and go on with the question. I think Ivan will add something to one of the questions. Right, Ivan? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah, do you want to take the first one about the commercial rent support? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, so the, the question, just for those who haven't seen it, I'm just going to read it back so everybody on the call understands the question, I'll answer it. Um, the commercial rent support, Oleg says, commercial rent support program who has the burden of application in this program? The program is applicable for small businesses. However, as a commercial landlord, our experience has been that tenants perceive that this is a landlord support program and the burden of application lies in the landlord. While the landlord is the ultimate beneficiary, however, has no intelligence over what does the tenant's balance sheet look like in order to see whether they qualify. So these are, there's a number of questions in that, with, baked within that question. I think these are all good questions. Um, the, the details on this are going to be released shortly, Alex. So, um, and if you want to uh, email my office uh, or call my office, we're happy to stay in touch with you as soon as those, that, that information becomes available. And if you have feedback on the program and how it works or doesn't work well. But I think, so the details have been ironed out because the, the, the federal government has committed to doing this, but to do this, we need to work with the provincial governments. We need their cooperation and support. It can't be done without them because uh, uh, commercial rents are the jurisdictions of provinces in Canada. Uh, so the details have been rolled out, but I hear your concern. We got to make sure that um, that you know, understandably, this is meant to be for the benefit of the renter, so the business person who's renting the the unit uh, from your within your building or within your property. Um, but if the it's also important that the that this provide, in my view, provide relief to to the landlords as well. Um, so, but the specifics of how that's going to be executed um, haven't been released yet. So when it is. Um, you'll hear about it, I'm sure, but if you'd like, sign up to my, my email list and I'll get you the specifics. But I hear your concern and I'll take that back about the need to make sure that both the landlord and the tenant are able to, to benefit from the program and that this isn't done disproportionately. I can take the, the next one. Uh, so the question is, uh, who are considered uh, NAL or non-arms length employees? Uh, so. Uh, whether or not you're arm's length with someone is a, is a question of fact, but generally it's people who are related to the controlling shareholder of a company. So a lot of times in, in smaller owner-managed businesses, you might have the owner working for the company as an employee, uh, their, maybe their spouse and their children. Uh, anyone related to that owner is going to be a non-arm's length employee. And the, the key difference when calculating, calculating the wage subsidy with a, a non-arm's length person is that you can only receive up to a maximum of 75% of the 
of what they were being paid before the crisis. And how you calculate that is your average weekly pay between January 1st and March 15th, 2020. Uh, you take that, you take 75% of that, again, capped at the $847 limit, uh, but that's the maximum you can pay uh, someone who's not arm's length. So if you didn't pay someone before, uh, you can't pay them now as, a, as payroll and receive the subsidy. If you'd like, I can take the next question. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question is uh, from from Ann. Um, how does an organization like UCSS Toronto, uh, I presume that's Ukraine Canadian Social Services, Social Services, yeah, that works with vulnerable and isolated seniors, get access to some of this community support funding? Uh, the organization is not considered eligible for and does not receive any funding from the United Way since it serves a specific ethnic community. And that's a great question. So. Um, I have a two-part answer to your question. First part is um, United Way is one of the three organizations that the government has provided this funding to for them to disburse to charities like yours. One is United Way, the other one is the Red Cross, and the third is Community Foundations Canada. Um, and based on what I know of the criteria uh, for this particular program um, for charities, uh, it is not, to my knowledge, it's not supposed to be restricted. In other words, they, we're not supposed to disqualify organizations because uh, they serve a particular community. But, but I need to look into that to be 100% sure. Um, so my suggestion to you is, is I would, when this program launches and you start applying, which I believe you can do now, with, I, would, I would reach out to the Red Cross and Community Foundations Canada and see if they will accept your application. That would be the easiest thing and quickest thing to do. And the second thing is, if you are not eligible uh, with any of those organizations, or if they tell you you're not eligible, please let me know, contact me at the, at the contact information I provided earlier, uh, and I will follow up on this and see if that can be addressed for you. The, I can take the next question from Michael. Um, do you anticipate that these programs will last more than four months? Um, Michael, I hope not. Uh, in the sense that I hope that we won't need them uh, because uh, I hope that we are able to, uh, you know, flatten the curve and ultimately eliminate the curve uh, so that we can return to normal um, and so that businesses can return to normal and operate and earn the revenues that they're accustomed to earning to, some, to a great degree. Um, but, but it's impossible for me, or I, I don't think anyone knows at this point, um, how long these programs will be in place. The one thing I will say is that I think you've probably seen over the past months, five weeks since this crisis hit, hit us very, very hard in Canada, that the federal government has been constantly announcing new programs and then adjusting, adjusting existing programs. And I think that's been in response to feedback that the government's receiving from MPs like me. We have daily calls with ministers about each of these programs, um, but also from business people who are reaching out to MPs, but also to government directly. So um, is as we get closer to further into the summer, depending on how things are going with respect to, to trying to quell the, the pandemic, um, we may need to continue to put in place new programs or expand or extend the existing ones. But I think those decisions will be made at that time. Uh, Zenon asks for CBA, uh, it's for operating costs only. Do you supply the CRA what the funds are spent on? Um, so Jacob, feel free to chime in if this is not a complete yeah. answer. I think it's Jacob's, yeah. yeah. Jacob, do you want to take that? Sure, yeah. Uh, so when you apply for the loan, it's through your financial institution. So you're, you're, not, you're just certifying that you will use these funds on non-deferrable operating costs. Uh, you are agreeing to an, a potential audit in the future of what you use those funds on. That is a criteria as part of the agreement, but uh, there's no requirement to submit what you've spent the funds on to CRA to receive the funds. Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, you want? Nope. All right. Okay. The next question from John Valinda. I think it's yours, Jacob, probably. Uh, just a question about Canada emergency wage subsidy. If the claim period is May 10th, June 6th, for example, and we pay people by month, then do we apply for CEWS on June 15th for payroll for May uh, 10, May 31, and then July 15th for payroll for June 1, June 6th? Is it prorated? Yeah, that's a good question. I've had, had that question come up a lot. Uh, so the, the way you calculate it is uh, 
it doesn't matter when you pay the payroll, it's what that payroll was in respect of. And the wage subsidy is calculated weekly. So you do have to prorate if you have a pay period that includes different weeks, uh, you have to prorate out the payroll for each week uh, during that time because you have to have what your weekly payroll is per employee to calculate the subsidy. So you, you won't lose out because you have a different pay period, but you just have to do the calculations so that you are calculating on a, on a weekly basis. Okay, and there are two more questions. They are from the same person, so they're connected. Could you please repeat the circumstances un under which an employer can include an, the employer contribution in calculating the 75% wage subsidy? And what is the criteria for receiving the maximum 25% business loan forgiveness? Yep, so for the, uh, the employer contribution of CPP and EI, uh, so you otherwise have to qualify for the wage subsidy for that employee. And then that employee has to be on paid leave. So not, not working at all, but being paid. There's, there's no criteria as to whether they're being paid their full salary from before or a reduced salary, but they, they have to be on leave. So you're not expecting them to do any work, but you are paying them. That is uh, how you receive the employer contributions back. And the second question, the- What's the criteria for receiving the maximum 25% business loan forgiveness? So for that one, it's uh, any amounts that you repay before December 31st, 2022 uh, will, will be forgiven. That's, that's the only criteria that, that has been introduced. Uh, so in the example, in the full example, if you repay 30 of the 40,000, the full 10,000 would be uh, repaid. Or the full 10,000 would be forgiven. Okay, thank you. And the last questions to this panel, does the director become liable if they didn't return CEBA? And that one I don't know off the top of my head whether there's a personal guarantee required. I know the loans are backed by the government. I I, I would uh, I would say that you'd have to review the review the term sheet before agreeing to anything and make sure that if there are any personal guarantees that you're aware of what you are signing for. I don't know if anyone else knows uh, further details yet. Yeah, if I could just add, my understanding is that the director is not liable. Um, but, but obviously the, 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 the CBA, the Canada Emergency Business Account, the $40,000 loan or the up to $40,000 loan um, is issued by your bank. Um, and so you obviously, if there are any conditions that your bank imposes, obviously those are the ones that are in place. But from uh, the way the program is designed, it doesn't hold the directors liable, no. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ivana. Thank you, Jacob, uh, for your presentations and your answers. The next speaker is um, uh, Uliana from, um, from, from VP from Connor Clark and Lund Private Capital. Um, she will talk about investment climate and strategy. Uh, Ulana has more than 15 years of experience in the financial industry. Prior to joining, prior to joining Connor Clark and Lund Private Capital, she worked for a number of investment managers in retail sales, most recently with BlackRock in Toronto. Additionally, she has experience in project management and in marketing discretionary investment solutions for clients. A graduate of the University of Ottawa with Bachelor of Commerce, Ulana also holds an MBA from the University of Western Ontario. In her spare time, Ulana enjoys traveling, cooking, skiing, and is an avid reader. Ulana is currently a board member of the Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association of Toronto and the Ukrainian Canadian Social Services of Toronto. Ulana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, and I apologize. I was, uh, I had, I popped off. So I had a little bit of uh, technical issues here, but I'm back on. Uh, so I just wanted to, if um, Ihor, if you're helping me, if you can flip to the next slide, that would be great. And and just like when Yvonne started, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can get any of my uh, contact information uh, from uh, Ihor or Sviatoslav. Please do. And uh, um, also at the end of the presentation, I'll have my uh, contact information if you have any other questions or would like to get in touch. 
just to start, uh, Connor Clark and Lund Private Capital uh, is a division of Connor Clark and Lund Investment Management, which was founded in uh, March of 1982. We are considered to be Canada's largest uh, independently owned investment manager and uh, currently manage over $77 billion across Canada. Uh, the private capital group was started in 1997 as an extension of the investment management group to specifically manage money for individuals, uh, high net worth individuals and foundations and endowments and uh, nonprofit organizations. The organization on the whole is 100% employee owned, very entrepreneurial in nature. We currently manage money for over 2,800 families across Canada. Over 300 nonprofit organizations, foundations, charities, indigenous communities, and uh, on our institutional side, which is actually the larger part of our uh, of our assets, are uh, are the um, uh, institutions, and that is um, all six chartered banks that we manage money for. We're the only Canadian manager that's outsourced by the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, and we also manage money for over 175 institutional clients. Now, I just wanted to give you a little bit of that background on who CCNL is because we're not uh, outside of um, the institutional landscape. We're, we're very well known, but outside of that, we, um, uh, we're, 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 we don't advertise. So a lot of people don't recognize the name. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on who we are. So if you can just flip to the next slide, thank you. So uh, just in terms of uh, what's been happening, I, I wanted to give a little bit of a, 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 go through a couple of slides quickly from our quarterly review. As you can see, it's been a pretty tumultuous quarter. Uh, this is as of March 31st. We saw that uh, Canadian equity markets were down almost 21%. International equities were down uh, just a little bit over 15%. US equities, uh, almost 12%. And Canadian bonds uh, were slightly up at 1.6%. We did see some positive returns out of currency, and that's because the Canadian dollar actually uh, fell in relation to the US dollar and to, and to other international currencies. So you can see uh, below, um, in terms of internationally, we, um, we gained 5.3% and uh, versus the US dollar. Uh, um, the US dollar gained 7.8% on the Canadian dollar. So that was, that's some positive if you're, if you have investments in those currencies. Uh, just in terms of, of, of what actually happened, we saw a lot of different things happening. So uh, obviously the COVID-19 really rattled markets, uh, especially in, in March. Uh, we, uh, we see there's a lot of uncertainty and it's, and it's really difficult to forecast what's going to, um, what's going to happen because that is really, uh, depends on how the health crisis is managed to a large extent. Um, but we did see uh, supply shocks that's through factories shutting down. Uh, in terms of demand shocks, people are at home, they're losing jobs, they're spending less. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's creating um, a big demand issue. And in terms of, um, we saw an oil price shock and really impacting the Canadian markets uh, just because uh, Canada is so exposed on the energy front. We saw oil decline 66% in March before rebounding uh, towards the end of March, and we're still seeing issues. So uh, as supplies increase, just because the demand isn't there right now, uh, it's causing, it, there's nowhere to store oil. So it's pushing prices. It, it actually, in the, this past week, pushed prices into negative territory. Um, and uh, that has since uh, changed, but, um, but that's basically what, um, what we've seen. Um, this is, I mean, this is coming after an 11 year bull market. We, um, as a firm, we have been managing our portfolios quite defensively, just knowing that that bull market was coming to an end and we were seeing indicators that it was coming to an end. Uh, on top of that, with all of this happening, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit more, we've seen historic levels of government stimulus. And uh, that's, been, that's been really, really important uh, in terms of, um, of, of um, how things have shifted. So if you could just go to the next slide, that'd be great. Okay, so just in terms of the global economic environment, uh, we want to touch on three, uh, three sort of uh, areas. And the direction of the arrows illustrates where we think uh, growth, inflation, and monetary policy is moving. So in terms of growth, uh, we think it's going to take a large negative hit in the second and third quarter due to global lockdown measures. Uh, it's, it's what we call a technical recession. Um, uh, that means there's uh, two quarters of negative growth. We feel that's almost certain. And um, the large fiscal stimulus program should help growth recover faster. So 
what we've been seeing, and uh, I don't know if you've been watching Trudeau come on TV every day, but almost every day they're announcing new fiscal programs to help aid um, aid everybody. That is, people who've lost their jobs, um, companies that aren't able to operate or could go out of business. There's a lot of things going on, and that's a lot of what um, Yvonne and Wally uh, covered in their previous presentations. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, there has been uh, a, a fair amount of, um, well, quite quite um, uh, a lot of um, monetary stimulus. So I'm um, gonna go into that in a moment. Inflation, in the near term, uh, negative growth is going to drive inflation lower. Um, there's certain products that may experience high levels of inflation, um, especially medical equipment would be a good example. And looking ahead, we see supply, uh, supply disruptions and larger deficits may lead to higher inflation in 2020, or 2021, sorry. In terms of monetary policy, most global central banks have almost universally moved interest rates to zero percent. Uh, we saw the Bank of Canada quite dramatically reduce rates in March. We saw the Fed uh, also quite dramatically reduce rates in March. This is all setting the stage as, as stimulus and it's, it's, and it's basically setting the stage for recovery. So we may not see the impact of that right now, but we will uh, eventually when things start to recover. Uh, central banks have all reinstituted aggressive quantitative easing measures, and uh, that includes <clears throat> um, government debt, uh, purchasing government debt, corporate debt, corporate debt ETFs, and other cases, um, in some cases, equity ETFs. And this is to improve liquidity because when we saw markets drop so precipitously in March, it, was, uh, it, it all happened so fast that uh, it really, really disrupted liquidity. So the governments had to step in and do something very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of the, um, the uh, situation monitoring the, the spread of COVID-19, we can see here China versus the rest of the world. China was obviously the first in and the first out of this. Uh, they really did implement almost um, very, very, um, uh, they have a very different relationship with their citizens, citizens than, the, than the Western world the government does. So the, 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 um, the lockdown measures that they implemented were uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit more severe than what we're seeing in North America or what we're seeing in Europe. So we're seeing the impact of that lockdown and that recovery right now. Uh, the rest of the world, we're still seeing um, uh, cases increasing or plateauing at this point due to the measures, but we do expect it will take a bit longer for us to recover because we haven't locked down to the same extent that China did. Um, in the second graph, you can see um, Italy versus South Korea, um, obviously different timelines um, in terms of when the uh, peaks occur and, and uh, when the lockdown occurred. So that obviously shifts how the, um, how the numbers look. Uh, next slide. And just in terms of uh, the amount of global stimulus that we've seen, it's almost similar to what we saw in World War II. Uh, we can see in the US and the total percentage of GDP is, and that's on the far right um, column, 35% in terms of stimulus, and that's liquidity injection and fiscal stimulus uh, included. Uh, this and total global stimulus, 17.3% of global GDP has actually been uh, has has actually been incorporated. So this is huge, uh, and we may not see it right away, but we are starting to see it take effect, uh, and that kind of leads into actually the next slide. Thank you. So in the environment we see playing out, um, the path forward uh, is really about controlling the health crisis and the effectiveness of the monetary and fiscal policy. To the right, you see the early signs of stimulus working, and this is the money supply on the right. Why is money supply so important? Well, that's all that fiscal st stimulus that we're seeing uh, coming into the market. That's all the money uh, that goes into people's pockets and then subsequently allows them to buy things, and that helps to um, in, um, keep the economy afloat. So when we see unprecedented levels of fiscal stimulus, and that is um, affecting the, um, the money supply so quickly, um, that means it's working. So um, the fact that it's working, that's great. We want to see the other other things will start to take effect as well. It doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. Um, we also need to see how quickly employment improves and also the behavioral changes. We will see behavioral changes, but, um, but we do feel that um, given some time, uh, much of it will return. That is, much of our normal behavior will return once we feel safe again, once there's a vaccine, et cetera. So uh, we just don't know how long it's going to take before that happens. Um, we are seeing encouraging 
information coming out of China. And I know it's um, difficult to necessarily believe everything that we see out of China, but the reality is that um, it's encouraging. We see, um, we see energy usage, we see traffic patterns, and um, that kind of information is really, uh, is really valuable and helps us to see that things are improving there. So um, once again, that's, uh, that's encouraging. Uh, next step, I just wanted to talk quickly about uh, strategy and what you can do in this kind of environment when it comes to managing money. And um, a couple of quick slides about this, uh, just to give you a, big, a larger uh, kind of bigger picture. Asset mix uh, is really um, the most one of the most important decisions that you'll ever make. And asset mix is, is basically the balance between stocks, bonds, and other asset classes in your portfolio. It largely determines your returns and your risk level. Uh, it's a combination of what we call strategic asset allocation. That's like your long-term uh, strategic decision about your asset allocation and what we call tactical asset allocation. And that's what our teams do on a short-term basis to basically respond to what's happening macroeconomically so that uh, we can uh, make slight changes to the portfolio to um, either reduce risk or, or improve returns over time. And really what it is, is diversification is key. So you want to make sure that you have the right asset mix for you with, with, um, with access to many diversified, many asset classes. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to qu quickly brush on what are those asset classes? What does that mean? Well, um, most of you might be familiar with just stocks and bonds, but uh, there's many other asset classes out there. And those would be uh, what we call alternatives. So um, those could be like hedge strategies. Um, that's something that's actually what we do for the uh, Canada Pension Fund Investment Board. We manage a very large market neutral or can also be called absolute return or long short um, hedge strategy that make that allows um, for the performance of the product is not reliant on the direction of the stock and bond markets and gives something that's similar in risk profile to, to bonds, but um, similar in return to uh, stocks. The other types of um, alternative investments that there are are private loans, which are secured loans to mid-sized Canadian companies. We charge between five and 12%, on average about 8%. Uh, nice replacement for some of that fixed income that is really not returning or bonds that aren't re really giving you much interest at this point. Uh, commercial real estate, uh, this is a portfolio of, of commercial industrial and retail real estate. Once again, doesn't uh, we own properties, it doesn't move in the same way as your stocks and bonds, your publicly traded securities. Uh, so provides protection and diversification in that level. Um, returns between um, eight and 11% over time. Same thing with infra infrastructure, portfolio of of infrastructure projects, predominantly energy, solar, and hydro. And the balance would be traditional infrastructure projects like, uh, like schools and hospitals that are government backed, also meant to return about eight to 11% over time. Private equity, very specialized. Uh, we do this for uh, very high net worth individuals um, or organizations who might have five million or more in investable assets and want to take advantage. Um, it's considered a little bit more higher risk, higher return. That's why we have um, an ask for a higher asset level to access um, this particular asset class. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick, uh, quick run through on how it works. On the left, we have your traditional portfolio, which would be balanced between stocks and bonds. We have a return expectation of 5.8% over time. Uh, maybe you're a retired person and you, you've managed to save your million dollars. You, you, you need to take out $50,000 um, from that asset a year. You think 5.8% would be enough. Well, long term, we anticipate inflation to be about 2% over time. So you need to return about 7% on that portfolio. Um, you can see in terms of risk, your probability of a 20% decline on this portfolio, about 35%, but you're not making enough. You're gonna eat, um, eat into the capital base if you're spending that much. Uh, so what can you do? You can tilt your portfolio, you can add more stocks or what we call equities. Uh, unfortunately, it also increases the risk. So here we've tilted to add more equities. Uh, our return expectation increases to 6.4%, but our risk, our probability of a 20% decline um, in, um, increases to 58%. Probably too high for most people and it's still not meeting the mark in terms of what your, what this, uh, you know, example required return would be. If we move to a portfolio that's more diversified, you can see we've added um, additional asset classes of the non-publicly traded securities and uh, some hedge and um, meets the return expectation uh, just uh, slightly above it. 
and uh, decreases the probability of a 20% decline to 20%. So you can see how it improves the return potential, but also decreases the risk profile. So much more appropriate um, for an older individual or maybe even for an organization, um, a nonprofit organization that has a certain return requirement that must manage to a certain risk level. So that's, a, that's one example. There's obviously many, many different combinations and permutations that can be done. This is just a very, very simple example illustrating the impact on the portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. So this one, uh, just important to maintain a diversified approach. This really shows the cyclicality of different asset classes. Uh, I, I, I have head strategies referred, um, basically circled here, but you can see how, um, how cyclical that um, the performance has been of hedge strategies, but you can look at Canadian equity, which in 09 and 2010 were at the top of the um, performance um, profile here, and then but in, two, in 2011 came down to the bottom versus the other asset classes. So this is why it's so important to have a good mix of different asset classes. Um, the balanced portfolio, which shows a combination of all of these, really wins because it allows to reduce the volatility and help you meet your required return over time. Uh, uh, next, thank you. So um, the last uh, slide I wanted to talk about is really just an example of what the smart money is doing. Smart money are the pensions. So when we, this is an example from the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, uh, right out straight out of their annual report, uh, just cut and paste to show you what is their current asset allocation. Uh, and this is what, what the way they're thinking about it is that yes, we're getting a lot less returns from um, equities over time. We expect a lot less returns from equities over time. Um, fixed income has been, become very challenging because interest rates are so low. So it's becoming difficult for them to meet their required return. And that is they have a, they have a huge obligation to, um, to the Canadian public in order to, to meet. So when we look at what are they doing, this is exactly what they're doing. You can see under real assets, their allocation currently is to real estate infrastructure, energy and power, 24%, to private equities, another 24%. Um, that reduces their exposure to publicly traded securities. Um, so when we have situations like we've seen in the last month, uh, the, the result and the impact is, is significantly lessened. And that's, that's really what's happening, but we're also helping to um, bring down that risk profile and improve the return potential over time. Uh, and last slide, please. Thank you. So this is just, um, uh, Sviatoslav already read this out for you, uh, uh, just a bit of a bio, but you can see my email address at the bottom, uh, utamuk at cclgroup.com, or if you, um, also my number is there, if you want to reach out to me um, uh, and you don't have a chance to catch this, please reach out to our organizers. They'd be happy to share my information with you. And at that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lana. Thank you for this great and deep dive into investment climate and strategy. Uh, we have one question, but I believe this one's addressed to probably Jacob or Ivan. I think it's more or less Jacob's from N72. For someone who operates as a professional corporation, can they access any of these loans to open a new office? Yeah, so the I guess the uh, the SIBA the, is, uh, would not be for capital expansion, and I believe the other two incentives are more for operating uh, working capital loans instead of uh, rather than expansion. I don't know uh, Yvonne, if you wanted to comment on if there's any other initiatives. Yeah. So from from the government's perspective, we haven't put in place uh, restrictions that would prevent you from using um, let's say the SIBA, the $40,000, the $40,000 loan um, towards an office or refurbishing an office or leasehold improvements in your office or whatever the case may be. Um, so these loans aren't restricted in that way. The other loan programs that, that you know, I've talked through that Jacob's um, speak, spoken to as well. So for example, the ones that come through Export Development Canada, through the EDC, through the BDC, um, you'd have to reach out to your, to your bank who would then co-lend with those organizations if you qualified. But um, I agree with what Jacob said in that these loans are primarily for working capital purposes. I mean, if we take a step back and we think about why these loans are there, really what we're trying to do is trying to help businesses bridge this very difficult period, this, this, this COVID-19 pandemic crisis period when revenues have dropped off, uh, dramatically when businesses dropped off and they're just trying to survive. And so the goal of these loans is to help get 
allow businesses to survive through that period. And then hopefully they recover on the other end. Um, so that's really, so the kind of loans that you need in those circumstances are like Jacob said, they're working capital loans for the most part, but there aren't any restrictions per se that would prevent you from spending some of the SEBA money on leasehold improvements. Um, but I think most businesses and nonprofits who take advantage of these loans will use them for working capital. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Jacob. Um, the next question from Oleg, it's towards Ilana. Ilana, do CCL analysts acknowledge the possibility for fundamental elimination significant decrease of risk in equities publicly traded debt? Since we can see the sentiment that no one deserves to go bankrupt, being supported by the unprecedented federal action in the capital markets up to and including by injunct bonds and similar VOC action. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Uh, uh, the question, um, I don't see that there would ever be an elimination of equities or um, of, sorry, the question disappeared, um, uh, an elimination of publicly traded uh, equities or debt. It, that doesn't make sense at all because they're an important asset class, uh, both important asset classes. It's really, we, in, in, in any short-term period, you can't make any predictions, but we can look, we have long-term uh, predictions on uh, how any given asset class will perform. Uh, and that determines our strategic asset mix for any given organization or individual. It's all about managing to risk. So you have to, we have to see how much risk in, in an organization or an individual can take and then from there, we can we can develop an asset allocation strategy that's appropriate um, for that individual or for that organization. Um, just um, in terms of this idea, no one deserves to go bankrupt. You're not going to go bankrupt owning equities or debt. It depends on which equities and debt you own. <laughs> um, so you want to align yourself with a manager, with a good manager. Um, and in terms of uh, being supported by the unprecedented Fed action in the capital markets, up to and including buying junk bonds and similar Bank of Canada action. I'm not sure what you're asking there in terms of the last component of your question. Perhaps you can elaborate a little bit. Um, let's wait for a second, probably all that will mm -hmm. uh, dry it. And I guess maybe, you know, um, looking at it too, uh, what the what the Fed is doing, what the Bank of Canada is doing by buying uh, by buying debt, right? Uh, they're they're basically creating liquidity in an unliquid situation. So that is basically saving the markets. It it, it really has nothing to do with what we're doing as a manager. Okay. Uh, so uh, we select the right equities to be in, the right fixed income to be in, um, the right asset classes to be in, and how those are managed. Um, what the Fed and the Bank of Canada are doing is creating some liquidity uh, in, a, in a short term period uh, in order to support markets. Uh, that, uh, so that's, that's something different. <clears throat> that's clear. But. Okay. It looks like we covered all the main items of today's web webinar. I would again ask all our attendees to answer the poll question regarding the province they are from. Before we end our webinar, I would like to take this opportunity and thank all of our speakers, Ulana, Ivana, Wally, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations and thank you attendees for your participation. Hope the webinar was interesting for you and helped address the issues you and your businesses are facing now in times of COVID-19 crisis. Uh, is there anything uh, speakers would like to add? I'll just, I'll just thank everybody for, for joining, if I may. Um, like I said at the beginning, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to me, to my office. Uh, uh, for If you have questions, follow-up questions on the elements of the presentation that, that, that I delivered, um, or, or if you have questions in the future about Government of Canada programs. Uh, also, like I said earlier, I do send out a, an email newsletter um, every couple of days, as soon as there's news or a change in the government programs, I send out an update 
Um, and, um, and so we'd be happy to add you to that list. That way you can keep up to date as to what's happening, both from, from the perspective of businesses, but also as far as individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I uh, just uh, thank you again to everybody for, for joining. And uh, if you have any questions, same thing, uh, you can reach out to myself or to, uh, to Wally. And uh, happy, to, happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks. And uh, likewise, thanks to everybody for attending. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions or uh, would like to reach out, my contact information uh, is with, uh, uh, with the organizers. And uh, once again, happy to answer any questions. And I would like to, to, to read two thank you notes from our attendees. From Michael Kostuk, thank you for doing this. And John Valinga says, uh, this is Catherine Valinga here. I want to thank the organizers for setting up this meeting. I just want to acknowledge how wonderful all the people in our community are. We are all working together in our areas of expertise and making a difference, indeed. And we have our poll results. So 71% of uh, attendees are from Ontario. We have 17% of representations from Quebec, 8% Alberta, and 4% Saskatchewan. Okay, so thank you all once again. Thank you, uh, speakers. Thank you, attendees. Uh, follow the Facebook page and mailing list of United Nation National Office of UCC for further for future events. Thank you.